understanding statistics can be very difficult, especially if you try to understand statistics in a vacuum. And that's why it's very important that when you try to learn statistics, you should know the context for which you are studying it. So that statistics will be more meaningful, it's also important for us to understand what we use statistics for. There are many areas for which statistics is used, and one of which is research. And that is what I will talk about today. So what is research? And how is statistics useful to research? Research is basically one of the methods that we use in order to know in order to acquire knowledge. Research is not the only way. There are many methods that we can use. For example, in order to learn something, we sometimes rely on those who we consider as authority in a certain field. We read books that are authored by experts. So that's one method of knowing. Another method of knowing is by using reason. We have the capability to figure out certain things by trying to make sense or trying to use reason. For example, you saw your friend uh, and she appears to be sad. And you also know that the results of an entrance exam to a certain college was just released and she did not pass. You can therefore assume that she might be sad because of the fact that she did not pass the entrance exam. So using reason, you're able to know something. Sometimes we also know certain things simply because of gut feel or intuition. That is also a source of knowledge or that is also a method of knowing. In most cases in our daily lives, we use these three methods in order to know and understand the world around us. However, there are certain instances when our questions might not be answered effectively by these methods. Your intuition cannot help you. Something feels unreasonable, but you observe it. And figures of authority in a certain field have or are saying conflicting things about it. So what other methods can we use? One other method is the scientific method. Because not all answers are available in books uh, and there are many unanswered questions, sometimes we have to rely on the scientific method in order for us to have our answers. The scientific method is an approach to acquiring knowledge that involves formulating specific questions and then systematically finding answers that are as accurate as possible. When we talk about science, there are two aspects. One is that it is a body of knowledge and the other one is that it involves activities for us to arrive at that body of knowledge. And such activity is what we refer to as research. Research can be defined as a systematic inquiry using disciplined methods to build knowledge that can potentially solve problems. So what does that mean? What is research all about? Personally, I consider research as a means of understanding something as a means of understanding a phenomenon or many phenomena in our world. What is a phenomena? A phenomena basically is an event. If you look around us, there are many events that are happening. There are many things that we can observe and even feel. Why is the sky blue? Why do I get sad for no particular reason? Why am I motivated in some subjects but not in others? Some relationships last while some relationships don't. Why is that? So these events are what we call as phenomena. And research is an attempt to understand these phenomena. Before this year began, many of us in our lifetime have not experienced what it is like to be in the middle of a pandemic. And because it is a rare event, we are not familiar with this particular phenomenon. And now that we are in the middle of it, we are experiencing what it is like to be in the middle of a pandemic. Do you feel anxious? Do you feel uncertain? Do you feel a certain sadness associated with this pandemic? And today, there are many people conducting research in order to understand what is going on around the world. And uh, if we will be more specific to the discipline of psychology, Many psychologists are conducting research to understand what is happening psychologically to people around the world. So, as what I have said, research is basically an attempt to understand a certain phenomenon. More specifically, understanding a phenomenon may involve trying to describe it as best as possible. A rich description of 
a phenomenon can even be regarded as a theory. Oftentimes, these elaborate descriptions become a cornerstone into the understanding of the mechanisms of a certain phenomenon. Theories are very important in research and statistics. Theories basically are a representation of the realities that we are experiencing, the phenomena that we are experiencing. Although theories exist in order to explain certain events, certain phenomena, you might think that we have the solution or the answers to all of our questions. However, the nature of theories is that they are not necessarily factual. They are attempts at explaining something, but not all of them are necessarily good explanations. And thus, another purpose of research is to test these theories by attempting to falsify these theories, theories can be made stronger when the attempts at falsifying it fail. Meaning to say, if I try to design a research that would like to dispute a theory and I fail at disputing it, that is evidence to suggest that the theory might actually be a good explanation of something. So that's another purpose of research, to clarify or verify the existing understanding. Lastly, because in essence, all theories are problematic and has certain flaws. Research is also important in order to improve these theories. There are many theories that we now know today that are a product of years and years of changes and modification and essentially evolution. As much as our understanding of certain things change, theories also evolve. Ultimately, when we understand the world around us, that also puts us in a better position to answer or solve the problems that we are experiencing as individuals and as a whole humanity. Not all research are the same. Research can be categorized as basic research or applied research. Basic research is essentially an attempt to create knowledge, not directly involved in solving a practical problem, and it's highly theoretical. So basic research is basic in the sense that its main agenda is to generate knowledge, whereas applied research is more practical in the sense that oftentimes it begins with a specific problem that needs to be solved immediately and the race to solve that problem requires applied research. For example, right now around the world, scientists are racing to find a vaccine for COVID-19. What they are doing right now is applied research. Researchers, on the other hand, who are trying to understand the emotional reaction of people to this pandemic with no specific application embedded in their objectives, what they are doing is basic research. Both types of research, to some extent, make use of statistics as a tool. However, today's discussion will specifically be anchored on basic research. So here is a model that summarizes what goes on in basic research. So the model begins with reality. So when we say reality, these are the things that we experience around us and perhaps psychologically also things that we experience within us. And if we try to break down this reality into components, then we are talking about phenomena or a specific phenomena. So let's pick a certain reality, a certain phenomenon. For example, we may have observed that some relationships last, some partners are faithful to what they said in the altar, till death do us part. While some relationships last for just a week, a month, a year. So why is it that some relationships are stable and some relationships fizzle out fast? So that is something that we can observe or perhaps even something that we have experienced. But what explains this aspect of reality? What explains the stability of relationships? So that is part of the complex reality. Now, of course, you yourself can forward a certain explanation. 
You can pause this video and think about it. Think about that question. Try to explain why is it that some relationships last forever while other relationships don't. Have you thought about it? Essentially what you're doing is you are theorizing. You are creating a mental representation of a certain reality. Of course, your theories are personal theories, which are different from what we regard as formal theories, which we find in books. Formal theories are more elaborate and they are a product of years of research and in essence they are more comprehensive in trying to explain reality so with the complex reality which we want to understand some people forward certain explanations just like what you did a while ago but in a more formal sense and those explanations of that reality is what we refer to as theory theory so theory essentially is a representation of reality an attempt to represent reality consider what you're seeing right now what are you seeing you're not seeing me you're not seeing the real me you're seeing a representation of me a digital representation of me a series of ones and zeros which is interpreted by your device and comes out to you as what appears to be me. But what you're seeing is not literally me. What you're seeing now is a close representation of me some days ago when I recorded this video. So a theory essentially works like that as well. It is a simplified representation of reality. We will get to the rest of the model later on. But let me focus on theory. The theory involves what we refer to as variables and that these variables have relationships. And the theory also talks about that. The idea that a certain reality can be represented by a theory is a notion of a particular research paradigm which we call as post-positivism. Before I continue, I'd like to point out that not all research and not all researchers are the same. Fundamentally, research differ in terms of paradigms or research differ in terms of the very basic worldview of the researcher. And when I talk about this worldview, different researchers have different beliefs regarding what is reality. So the belief about the nature of reality is what we refer to as ontology. Some believe that reality exists uh, and that there is only a single reality, while other researchers believe that a single objective reality is really difficult to pinpoint and it might not actually exist. And the reality that is important is the one that we personally experience, the one which we experience here. So going back, the idea that reality can be represented by a theory is a popular notion of the research paradigm post-positivism. And if we are talking about statistics, although not mutually exclusive, statistics is used at its maximum in the paradigms positivism and post-positivism. So what are the basic tenets of post-positivism? First is critical realism. And what does that mean? It means that most positivists believe that one, reality exists or reality is assumed to exist. And if there is a single reality, therefore that reality can be captured and represented by a theory. But post-positivism also recognizes that any attempt of capturing this reality will be imperfect because of our limited understanding and because of the complex nature of various phenomena happening around us. Therefore, post-positivism recognizes that whatever theory that we generate in order to explain something would have certain limitations. These theories are imperfect or, if I will be blunt, theories to some extent are always wrong. 
But not because they are wrong, they are useless. Those are different things. Yes, theories might be limited, theories might be wrong, but some theories are actually useful. Post-positivism is also strongly associated with quantitative methodology, although of course not mutually exclusive. Uh, I'm not saying that quantitative methodology is only used in post-positivistic research. Certainly, quantitative methods can also be used in constructivist research, but there is a strong association between the two. But that strong association should not be regarded as mutually exclusive. So when I say that post-positivism believes in the existence of reality and that such reality can be imperfectly captured by a certain theory, therefore, when we consider theories, theories basically are simplified explanations of the events around us. And what do we see when we talk about events around us or phenomena? More specifically, the events around us involve different variables that have relationship with each other. So in its most basic form, a certain theory is comprised of things such as this. Variable A, predicting, influencing, or having an impact on variable B. For example, exercise might have an impact on health. Is that reality? To some extent, we may have observed that in the past. To some extent, it sounds reasonable. So a certain theory might say that doing exercise is good for your health. One might also suggest that believing in yourself and your capabilities that you can succeed in something can also result to actual success. A while ago, I asked you, what is your possible explanation with regard to the fact that some relationships last and others don't? What you're seeing in the screen now is a visual representation of a certain theory that attempted to explain the very question I posed a while ago. This theory is the investment model of relationship stability by Roosevelt. So at the very end of the model, you can see right here, stability of the relationship. Uh, and the theory is suggesting that in order to arrive at that, there are a series of events that could lead to that. Most immediately, it suggests that commitment to the relationship is a very important factor in relationship stability. And furthermore, to be committed, one needs to have these three, which are satisfaction with the relationship, level of investment, and quality of alternatives. What are these three? Satisfaction basically is whether or not you are happy with the relationship. Certainly, we are more likely to commit when we are happy in the relationship, and we are less likely to commit when we are not happy with the relationship. Now, how do we become happy? The theory also suggests that there are certain things that can predict happiness in a relationship and you can see it right here to be happy people consider rewards or what they get out of the relationship so what have you gotten out of your relationship what are the benefits what are the rewards of being in that relationship second there are also certain costs of course in a relationship you know there is a trade-off on one hand there are certain benefits to it on the other hand you also have to you know, to some extent give up something so there are certain costs and lastly we have the comparison level so that means to say that different people have different expectations of rewards and costs and you know, our comparison level to that expectation also contributes to whether or not we will be satisfied um, another factor for commitment is the level of investment in the relationship. What is an investment? It's something that will be lost if the relationship or will be compromised if the relationship dissolves. For example, you have common property, you have a joint bank account, you have children, you have common friends, that when you break up, those things will be compromised. Lastly, another thing that can contribute to commitment to relationship will be the quality of alternatives. Sometimes we are not happy with our relationship, there is very little investment, but we still want to commit. Why? Because we do not like the alternative. And what is the alternative if we break up with our partner? To be alone. And if you don't like that alternative, 
then even if you're not happy, even if there is really not much investment, you're still willing to commit to that relationship. Sometimes there are people who are very happy with their relationship. They have you know, an abundant investment, but because the alternative is very attractive, sometimes that can still compromise their commitment. So what you're seeing in the screen right now, in essence, tries to answer or tries to explain the question we posed a while ago about relationship stability. Do you agree with what you are seeing? Do you agree with this theory? Now remember, it has been pointed out that most positivists believe that there is reality, the reality of relationship stability, and the model we're seeing right now is an attempt to capture that reality. However, also remember that most positivists also believe that this attempt to capture reality is an imperfect one. You might be thinking, there might be other factors, or you might be thinking, I think, I think this current explanation has missed out certain things or has, has exaggerated the importance of a certain aspect of this model. And that might also be true. Now, this theory is limited, but is it useful? Perhaps. And if it's a useful theory, that's good. So on the one hand, we have reality, the reality of relationships. And then we try to explain that, represent that reality with a theory. Now, given this theory, we now have a working understanding of how relationships work. And theories are important because sometimes it can be a source of answers to some of our questions. So if one asks at a personal level, how do I increase the chance that my relationship with this person would last? Then here you go these might be the ingredients that you need for your relationship to last long. Theories definitely are sources of answers for research problems or research questions. For example, a researcher conducted a study and proposed a research question with regard to relationship stability or commitment or satisfaction. The previous theory that we have examined a while ago can be a source of possible answers. And these possible answers are what we call as hypotheses. Let's say, for example, that a researcher is interested in um, relationship stability and he wants to know what are the major contributors of relationship stability. The theory that we examined a while ago suggests that most immediately, commitment to a relationship influences stability of the relationship. Therefore, the researcher can hypothesize that individuals who have higher commitment to a relationship are more likely to have stable relationship. If the research question is about commitment, and this doesn't have to necessarily be commitment to a relationship, this might even be commitment to, let's say for example, an organization, the theory that we examined a while ago can also offer possible answers. Based on Roosevelt's theory, the researcher can hypothesize that individuals will be more committed to a relationship or even an organization or other forms of commitment when that individual experiences satisfaction, has some level of investment, and have low qualities of alternatives. So that's the nature of hypothesis. The hypothesis should not be based on personal opinion. Hypotheses are based on theory. So now that we have a prediction or a hypothesis based on theory, the next thing that needs to be done is to be able to test this hypothesis. We should take note that the hypothesis involves one, variables, for example, relationship stability and commitment, and second, the supposed relationship between the two. A while ago, we said that higher commitment will predict higher satisfaction. Higher commitment will predict better relationship stability. So to be able to test this hypothesis, it has to be represented again with something that is relatively concrete. Uh, and that representation is data. Data basically is another kind of representation. In a series of representations, this is the second one. The reality is represented by a theory. And the theory, which is the source of our hypothesis, can be represented by 
data. Data is a product of measurement. If you want to collect data on a particular variable or a set of variables, you have to measure these variables. When we say measurement, there is a strong inclination for us to think that we are only talking about numbers or quantities. However, measurement is not always about numbers or quantities. If you remember your basic statistics class, we have a form of measurement which we call as nominal scale or nominal measurement, which are not necessarily quantities, but basically names. Therefore, measurement can also be qualities or categories. So more accurately, measurement is the act of accurately representing a certain variation of a particular variable. If we consider gender, how do we measure gender? What are the variations of gender? If we consider academic performance, what are the variations of academic performance? One might think that the best numerical representation of the variation of academic performance would be one's grades. How about agreeableness? What is the best representation of the variation of agreeableness? Some are more agreeable, some are less agreeable. There are personality tests that can provide us with a numerical value that supposedly represents one's level of agreeableness. Now that we have data based on the tools that we have used to measure the variables in our hypothesis, we can now analyze this data. And that's where statistics comes in. Analyzing data or analyzing the relationships because data is meant to represent the variables in our hypothesis, analyzing the relationship of the data is also a representation of the supposed relationship of the variables based on the hypothesis. So if the hypothesis suggests that variable A has a relationship with variable B or that variable A can predict variable B, we cannot test that at a conceptual level. We have to measure them and thus variable A is represented by measure A and variable B is represented by measure B. And the way we test the relationship between the two variables is by examining the relationship between their respective measures. And analyzing the relationship of these two measures is one of the things the statistics can do. For example, we are interested in what contributes to academic performance and based on the literature, one of the factors that have been suggested is receiving effort attribution feedback and effort attribution feedback supposedly can contribute better to academic performance. So how do we test this hypothesis? First, we have to be able to measure the said variables. Perceived effort attributional feedback can be measured or represented using a perceived teacher attribution feedback scale, whereas academic performance can be represented by grades. And to examine the relationship between perceived effort, attributional feedback, and academic performance, researchers actually are examining the relationship between the measures of them. And when they found out that there is relationship, that then is inferred as evidence to the relationship between the two variables. Here is an example of a measure of teacher attribution feedback. And that's where statistics comes in. Statistics is defined as a set of mathematical procedures for organizing, summarizing, and interpreting information or data. That's one of the many uses of statistics. Of course, more specifically, my examples a while ago are in the context of research. So in summary, it now appears that as researchers, we are operating in different realms. We are interested in reality, the actual reality that we are experiencing. This reality is represented by theory, which can be a source of hypothesis, predictions for our research questions, and even for our personal questions. But in order to actually 
examine the veracity of these assumptions, hypotheses, and theories, they have to be represented again with something else, and that is measurement. Now, once we have examined the data and statistically analyzed it, whatever result that we get would have a consequence on the theory. It's either the data supports the hypothesis or it does not support the hypothesis. When the data supports the hypothesis, that strengthens the theory because the hypothesis was derived from the theory. When the data does not support the hypothesis that somehow weakens or at the very least questions the validity of the theory because again the hypothesis was derived from the theory so this cycle of theorizing drawing predictions from the theory collecting data to test the predictions and ultimately this cycle will either weed out the bad theories because a bad theory will continuously generate hypotheses that are not supported by data or strengthen a specific theory. And what is the value of a strong theory? What is the value of a theory that is consistently supported by data? That theory now can be used for application. So we bring the theory back to reality. So in our practice as professionals, best practices rely on good theories. So in summary, what we do as researchers is to examine the realities that we are experiencing, the psychological phenomena that we are experiencing by either theorizing about them or examining the theories, the existing theories that talks about these realities. As researchers, we test these theories by, by proposing research questions and forwarding hypotheses, collecting data that represents the variables in the hypothesis, analyzing the data, analyzing the relationships of the variables, and at the end of the day, saying something about the theory and collectively the work of the researchers helps us identify the best theories and the best theories are the ones which we recommend that practitioners use in dealing with their clients in their professional practice and not only practitioners other people can also use these theories parents students teachers, employers, everyone. So my short lecture on an introduction to research ends here. I hope that somehow I'm able to give you a bigger picture of what research is all about and what researchers do and how statistics is integral or related to research. I hope that you have a good day and I'll see you next time.